Hello, coming to you live from the 72nd Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting in beautiful Lindau, Germany. And this year, we have about 40 Nobel laureates and about 600 young scientists from 89 nations. And I'm speaking with one of them right now, Louise Drudel. Yes. Yes, from Denmark. And what kind of scientist are you? So I'm one of those kind of scientists that started out in pharmacy. So I come from a very natural science background. But then I started to realize that I actually wanted to move a bit more closer to medicines and society. So what I'm actually doing right now is using my science background to inform on regulation of medicines in particular, but also uh, using it for AI, uh, regulation of AI. Ah, right. So AI is one of the... Uh... The, one of the extra themes for the meeting this year. Um, the meetings in Lindau cycle through the sciences, uh, the Nobel Prize sciences. So there will be a physics meeting next year, then a chemistry meeting, and then again, like this year, medicine and physiology. So within that, we have some sub-themes this year of diversity, AI, and climate change. Yes. So you have this. So you're. Oh, you've already been interested in AI and the regulation of AI. Yeah. Yes, I have, and I've also done some work on it in a postdoc. So what I think we are, at least from the regulatory perspective, what we're seeing is that we're not really there yet. We don't exactly know how we should regulate it. We're typically focused on regulating on uh, products so that we ensure they have a high quality, safety, and efficacy. But how do we really? ensure that we have like the, uh, the the same measurements that we used to do but in a completely new context for example with uh, like self-learning ai how do we know when the efficacy changes yeah so are you are you very critical of ai or um are you excited about the possibilities but you also see the need for regulation yeah so yeah. i i think like so many others i'm thrilled about the prospects the developments it's i mean it's kind of a bit of mind-blowing what's possible to do and what is already ongoing like we heard from from one uh, from uh, the heidelberg lecture yesterday and i think while there's so many prospects i think it's from we need to remember not being too blind by the like our by our enthusiasm but that we also consider how these systems will be used in practice, what it is that the consequences of them will be um, going forward, like for example with diversity. You know, interestingly, uh, before I came to this meeting, obviously AI has all sorts of possibilities that we've been discussing, like self-driving cars, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm a comedian and artist. I have a lot of artist friends, so a lot of the issues have been about training models on copyrighted material without permission and is this art and uh, problems with education and um, so to come here and all of a sudden see that the main thing is like a million topics about how AI can be used in medicine mm -hmm. um, which what are some of like like I I've only have this sense of like the ability to see things in x-rays or other forms of imaging that, yeah. that, that aren't obvious to the human eye. Yeah, I think one example we heard about yesterday that I hadn't heard about before, I thought it was super fascinating, was that actually there's ongoing developments of how we can use our smartphone's flashlight to detect hemoglobin in the blood. Like, what a cool application. <laughs> so many persons in the world have a smartphone. This is some application that might be super relevant but at the same time, we also need to make sure that this uh, data is also then distributed to the right uh, persons and not being combined or collected only in, in one entity, as far as I see it. So b before you sort of got into uh, regulatory stuff, tell me more about your science. Did you always know you wanted to be a scientist in this sort of uh, yeah, pharmacy area? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that I, th I don't think I was so conscious at the time, but I've always been super fascinated by nature and by chemistry in particular. I loved chemistry in like elementary school and I was not very popular for it, but I just <laughs> loved it. And uh, that- What do you love about it? Uh, the simplicity, the way it makes everything like combine. It, it explains what we see, what we do, the materials. It's just so, everything is just chemistry. And I think that was really what like, and then I got an advice when I was in high school 
uh, because I had uh, so like the low level of chemistry because you everybody starts out with that in high school in Denmark and I, I just felt like there was something about it and I asked him like my then teacher and he said it only gets better so I chose mm -hmm. it on the high level it's called and I just got so yeah just so into it and just so fascinated by it that I but I also knew I wanted to help people and help like humans and then I found out that pharmacy that combines it and at least in Denmark we are, it's more focused on pharmacology, biochemistry, chemistry, of uh, physics, and so on. Excellent. Is there something that you wish more people understood about science? I think it's... Oh, that's a good question. I think I, I would love that people understood more that the scientific uncertainties are not uncertainties the way that most other people understand uncertainties because just because we there's uncertainty inside something doesn't mean that might be a relation it might just not, or a, a correlation between things it might just be that we are not certain enough of it yet to say it with certainty like with scientific certainty yeah that's and good and yeah i think that that would be nice i think just that's also what we found in the pandemic and so i think there was a lot of science communication that did, maybe didn't go so well um, as it as i would have hoped it did and this could be in your science or broader. Mm. Um, is there a question you most want the answer to? Ooh, that's a good question as well. I think, can, I have the, can, can we take another one and then I will just yeah, have yeah. a thought we about it. Yeah, we don't even it. need that one. Uh, let me, let, let's talk about the meeting a little bit. Yeah. And so because of the pandemic, a lot of the people I've talked to this year were originally supposed to come in 2020 or 2021, or, and they're finally here. Um, what was your situation? Did you participate in any of the virtual stuff? Yes, I yeah. did. So I was invited for the 2020 meeting as well. I must admit, it was a very, it's the, I think it's probably the best online experience I had of a conference or a meeting, but it just doesn't match what you experience in real life. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about one of the highlights from the 2020 experience. Yeah, so there Louise. was, yeah, there was a lot, there was a lot of them. So one of them was actually one of your uh, things. Oh, really? Yeah, which was that <laughs> I learned a lot about how you communicate well uh, using video presentations. I didn't know anything about that. It was really useful during the, the lockdowns and so on. But also another highlight for me at the time was that I w participated in an open exchange with Professor Elizabeth Blackburn. And I asked her about our competition and the, sometimes a competitive mindset in science and how one should deal with that as a young scientist. And I, w I still remember her reply because I'm still, I, I liked it a lot and, and it could really resonate with me which is that, well, we know, I mean, the PIs, the, the general, they, it's not an advantage to be competitive and not helping others. The ones that get furthest are the ones that want to help others, help educate others, inspire and share their knowledge. Those are the sciences that succeed. You know, At least that was what her message to me was when I asked her. Yeah, she's great. And you know, um, a couple days ago, I spoke to another laureate, Michael Young, mm -hmm. and uh, as is often the case, he shared his Nobel Prize with two other competitors, but they were competitors who uh, ended up collaborating. So they cooperated. You know, you're cooperating with a competitor. You know, there's this part of you that you want to get there first, but it was through their cooperation that they all ended up sharing the Nobel Prize. Yeah. And it was better for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Sounds like a win-win. So you're here and it's fabulous and interesting. What have some, so we had the opening ceremony on Sunday and a couple sessions, Monday, Tuesday, is today Wednesday or Thursday? What I, day is it? I is it already Thursday? It is, it's unfortunately crazy. it's already Thursday, but I actually had to ask myself that question this morning <laughs> uh, about what day it was because I, do, I couldn't really remember. That's also because you're so here. Like, it's just so, embedding that you don't really notice what day it is because you're just here. Yeah, very full days. You don't yeah. want to miss anything. But so tell me about some of the highlights uh, you've experienced here this week. So I think there's been multiple and it's, it depends a little on what level, I guess, and or maybe not level, but different kinds uh, of experience and highlights. It's all from the international evening, uh, which was focused on Indonesia learned a lot about cultural things from Indonesia. That was one aspect. 
but also just hearing Nobel laureates in their lectures and particularly Agora Talks, I've enjoyed so much because there's a bit more time for interaction and questions. And just to see, like having such brilliant young scientists and the Nobel laureates all around you, you can ask questions, scientific, non-scientific, also about this like softer uh, skills needed in science. There's a lot of debate as well on this as well. And it's just, it's everything that comes together that just yeah. makes it so unique. and inspiring beyond I, I, I want to say that you know there's food and coffee cups being set up and stuff and it may seem active behind us but this is nothing there's a session going on where almost everyone is in the session and but there are always a little bit of going on out here there's probably some people playing ping pong outside and walking yes. around um, uh, I, you have some mobility issues. Has, yes. How's the meeting been for that? And I want to, we talked about this a little before. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, what is the nature of your disability? Yeah, to start with the first, then uh, it's been really easy uh, getting around here. I've been a bit more in contact, I think, with the organizers prior to the meeting due to this. Um, but it's only, I've only been met with openness and really high willingness to make everything uh, so like accessible for me and, and very inclusive um, and I've to be honest I've also been asked by the committee by the from the for the Nobel laureate meeting about how I've been found in it and received like uh, business cards to reach out afterwards if I have any suggestions for improvements so I only feel very well met uh, with regards to that so why it is that I use a wheelchair that is because I have a muscular disease it's a, one of those super duper, duper, duper rare diseases. Uh, so apparently, there's um, I have it's a gene called Fukutin, which I don't really know how to pronounce correctly in English. Um, I have two SNPs, so two single base pairs that are have been that are mutated. They're just in the wrong place in the gene with regards to that. That's why it affects me. The thing is, the doctors were so happy because they got to publish a publication because no, they hadn't heard about this particular gene mut mutation before. And the most like obscure thing is that both of my parents are carriers without knowing it because no one else has it. And why the fourth of a chance that they actually both give that DNA strain to me? I mean, statistically impossible, but here I am. So that's yeah, why. This is very rare. You mm -hmm. said you're the only person with this? That's what I was been told. So uh, uh, mutation is this, but in this particular gene causes muscular diseases. It's the most, I've been told uh, by my neurologist that it's the most frequent one in Japan. But outside Japan, that there are only 24 cases. And the one that I have is the mildest of the 24, but that there hasn't been discovered anyone with this particular mutation. So I guess it, that makes it pretty rare. And you mentioned uh, you did through childhood, this, this has been progressive, so you didn't yeah. start off in a wheelchair. No. So um, at the time that I was told that you have a muscular disease, I was 14, and I was doing karate, I played badminton. It was, um, it was a, bit, a bit difficult to relate to as 14 year old, I can only say. And, but then it's like slightly progressed, so I, last time I ran was when I was 20. I started using a wheelchair when I was 27. Uh, at that time, I only used it outside. I was only walking inside. And now I use it the most of the time, and I'm 34. Yeah. Does, do you think that it's... I didn't ask you this before we talked. No, but, but has it um, informed your view of life and the meaning of life and appreciation of stuff? Or, I mean, you yeah. obviously haven't let it stop you become no. a professional in the field that you wanted to be in? No, I think for me, that's been a, I don't really think it's been a conscious decision, but it's a, a thing that I've been aware of due to others' reactions to my situation, which is that either you could let it stop yourself or you can say, okay, I might not be able to do things, the things that you would normally do, but typically there's always a different route you, that you can find and then you can do whatever it is that you want still. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, that was another part of the question, but I don't remember. Oh yeah, if it viewed That sounds like lunch soon coming. That's okay. And we uh, almost should invite them in since they're, yeah. they're in the stream already. Yeah, but I think what I really find to be learning, what I've learned from it, is to really grasp the present, use all of the opportunities that you are being presented to, 
or just if you have an idea, maybe I could go talk to this big shot because I have an idea and I want to hear his thoughts. And maybe I could get a spot in the lab. Maybe I can just get a contact and just do it because I mean, what what's the miss? Worst case, a person says no, and you're on status quo anyway. And so I'm just like trying to, yeah, just live life to the fullest. Like do things if you want to. I, I it was actually what meant. So I during my PhD. I uh, had the privilege to go to Harvard Medical School. And after that, I saved a lot for it. But then I went on to Hawaii, just because I knew that they had wheelchair accessible to helicopter tours. And that was like on my bucket list. I needed to do that. And I thought, I might not be able to do it in 10 years. I need to do it now. I think that's my, probably my take on it. I really like some of what you said. I think of this quotation that's often, it's attributed to this hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And that has become very relevant in my career. There are things that I have a lot of ideas. I don't always act on them. I don't always ask some, I shy away from proposing or asking something. But the times that I've gone ahead and done it and it worked out, I just think, wow, what if I hadn't asked? I almost didn't ask mm -hmm. and it happened. And, yeah. and it's like, don't, I've told some of the people here, mm -hmm. really don't be shy about approaching the Nobel laureates because you don't understand. They want you to approach them. Yes. And I know you're a little shy about approaching a Nobel laureate, but don't be because they're happy to talk to you. Yes, that's yeah. only been my impression. And they, they also really tell it also quite directly sometimes that they were here too. They were also young scientists trying to find their way and they are really offering their advices on all different sorts of things on how they made their way. And it's just beyond description inspiring. inspiring. Let me ask you just a couple final things about the meeting. Yeah. It's a very different kind of meeting. What, what will you tell your family and friends? Like, how would you describe this? What is the Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting? Oh, I mean, in short terms, it's just the best scientific meeting you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, I think to someone not in science, I would say that it's a meeting where you can really reflect, get inspired, but also inspiration and you can share experiences, both your own, but also hear about others, about things that are challenging, things that are successes, you can share the joys and, and that just, you, you made a lot of networking, with all different sorts of people, both in your own field, related fields, and that's just um, so unique. I think to some more with a science uh, view. If you get, ever get the invite, accept it. That's the only thing I will probably. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's so great. I was going to ask you if there were any other highlights, and I wonder if one, I was talking to you when a laureate uh, walked up Yes. And, and he walked up and started a conversation with you and had his Nobel medal in his pocket. Yes, that is definitely a highlight. I, I was so shocked. He, Are you one of our young scientists? I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. So, Who and was then, that? It was uh, Caitlin. And uh, I got, and now I have a picture holding the Nobel <laughs> prize medal. It's like, oh. <laughs> so I'm glad you're having fun. I am. And uh, thank you very much for taking that. When there's so much going on, to take the time to talk to me. Anytime, it was really a pleasure. Really appreciate it. I hope if uh, someone could hopefully get inspired. Yes, I'm sure someone will. And uh, again, one of the extraordinary 600 young scientists here this week, and we'll be meeting more of them. Thank you.